What we want you to understand about this TMJ concept is it works in two directions. It can work from the joint to the teeth or the teeth to the joint. And muscle is in between, and muscle is the, is the power source that then really creates the problems that are triggered by teeth or joints that are not in harmony. So when we look at the masticatory system, we don't want to just look at teeth, we want to look at all these muscles as well because they're all part of the masticatory system and they're things we deal with every day in terms of orofacial pain. Let's just read this to you. The physician of the masticatory system must understand how all the interrelated parts of the total system work in harmony. And if any one part of a system gets out of harmony, all the other parts are affected. And that's the, that's the key here. That in, You can't have one part of a system get out of sync without having a counter effect with something else. If you move something into position, something else has to get out of its way. You see, so... There, there's a, a harmony that we're after here in this system that allows you to have what Sig Ramford called a peaceful neuromusculature. And he said, all occlusal therapy is done for the purpose of achieving a peaceful neuromusculature. If we have a peaceful neuromusculature, we have a comfortable mouth. That's what we're trying to achieve, and, and that's what we can achieve. To achieve it, we have factors we have to learn to work with. And there are ten factors that control masticatory system harmony. I'm just going to go through those ten factors with you, and then we're going to take them each one, each one at a time and say, okay, why is this factor important? How do we evaluate it? What do we do if it's not, not in, the, in the right uh, condition? What's the first factor we're going to look at? the temporomandibular joint. That's a starting point for occlusion. It's a starting point of what we do with teeth. It's a starting point of where we look when we have orofacial pain. <coughs> Secondly, <coughs> excuse me, centric relation. We're going to spend a good bit of time on centric relation because it's the single most important thing you have to know as a dentist. You have to know what it is, you have to know why it is, you have to know how to get it, how to verify it, and what happens if you can't get it or don't get it. Third, roll of muscle. How does muscle respond in predictable ways to, as an example, occlusal interferences or joint disorders or such as that? Because we can, we can diagnose problems by looking at muscle and seeing which muscles are affected, how are they affected. The fourth is the anterior guidance. I said a minute ago, the single most important thing you had to learn as a dentist is what? I don't mind answers. Centric relation. Centric relation. The single most important thing you have to learn as a dentist is centric relation. Why do you say that? Because if you miss centric relation, you miss the starting point. Everything from there on is wrong. So if you don't start out in the right place, nothing works, okay? What's the second most important thing you have to learn? Anterior guidance. Now you'll see that. That's the back end of the mandible and the front end of the mandible. You learn those two things, how to diagnose, how to treat the back end and the front end of the mandible. What's in between is so simple it's almost absurd. <laughs> and we're going to help you understand that. But anterior guidance <clears throat> is not just a cosmetic thing. Anterior guidance is the key to the stability of your entire dentition. Tremendously important to comfort, long-term stability, function, everything you do with an occlusion is key to anterior guidance. Fifth, vertical dimension. Uh, Witt mentioned increasing the vertical dimension to solve a TMJ disorder. Do you know that a TMJ disorder is not caused by a loss of vertical dimension? Uh, and do you know what else? We'll talk about vertical dimension, but I'll just tell you right now. Comfort is not a factor in vertical dimension. Uh, changing a vertical does not alter a comfort factor in itself. Uh, and so we're going to talk a lot about vertical dimension because we have some flexibility on it, but we have to understand 
what we can do and can't do, vertical dimension. Some of the worst mistakes we see uh, resulting in uh, deterioration of a mouth are results that were, that were uh, mistakes that were made in vertical dimension. The neutral zone. I want to ha- I want to see a, uh, a hands raised. How many of you really uh, feel like you understand and work with the neutral zone on a regular basis? Not a hand goes up. I'm, I'm, I'll bet you there's one or two of you that just are a little modest about it. Do you know that this is a tremendously important aspect of everything you do in dentistry? It's a, if you don't understand the neutral zone, you're going to have failures. You know who's going to have major failures in not understanding? Orthodontists, surgeons, any dentist that puts a crown in, partial dentures, full dentures. If you don't understand the neutral zone, you're guessing. And, and that's not a good thing to guess at. The neutral zone explains how we get malocclusions, what to do about them. It's very easy to understand. I'm sure you're going to understand it when you leave here. So we're going to talk about that, the neutral zone. The envelope of function. We think of the envelope of function as something academic. Uh, We had to learn it in school, but we didn't know what it meant. The envelope of function is critical. You can't understand anterior guidance if you don't understand the envelope of function. Give you one clue about an envelope of function that makes it so important that you understand it. It's different for every patient. There's no, there's no norm for the envelope of function. You can't just say, well, everybody should have 15 degrees of this or whatever. It's got to be an individually determined thing, and it has to be determined in the mouth. Can't determine it on articulator. It's got to go to the mouth. But we have very definitive, very precise ways of determining exactly what that envelope of function is in every patient. You'll learn it. Not complicated. Long centric. How many believe in long centric? Uh, How many could define long centric? (laughs) Well, very few people can. Very few dentists can. Uh, It's one of the things that I've heard described all the way across the board. I'm going to help you understand it. It's a very important aspect that relates to the anterior guidance. And it's only related to the anterior guidance. It's not even related to back teeth. It's just related to front teeth. So we'll be talking about that when we talk about how do we determine the anterior guidance. The the, uh, long centric uh, is uh, part of that determination. Give you another little clue up front. About 50% of the people don't need a long centric. 50% do. Those that do and don't get it, you'll have problems of instability. You'll have wear, mobility, primitus, uh, or some problem related to the occlusion. And it'll be the kind of problem that you'll say, oh, well, this, you just got to get used to this. But you don't have to get used to it if you correct it. And then we have the occlusal plane. Occlusal plane is one of the most magnificent aspects of design of the masticatory system that I can, can imagine. And we're going to talk about that. It's not, just, <laughs> it's not just a chance thing. I happen to be a very, very strong believer in intelligent design. And this is intelligent design at its best. And we're going to describe it to you. All right, now, we've given you nine factors of, uh, of occlusion. What have we not told you yet? The key, the thing, the, the place where dentists want to start. But they're not ready to start until these nine factors have been established. And that is what? The occlusal contacts. See, how the teeth come together. Where the contacts are. What happens with the, with the anterior relationship in the front. All of that is dependent on harmony with those other nine factors. And so we're going to try to give you rational uh, reasons for understanding each one of those factors. And so we're going to start with some concepts. So if you go to your tab in your book on concepts, uh, we're going to look at occlusion from this standpoint. Occlusion and everyday dentistry. 
Because occlusion plays such a dominant role in almost everything a dentist does, not understanding that role, and here's a key that I want you to, to take home with you. Not understanding occlusion and the role that causes a major amount of wasted time and makes it impossible to be predictive about complete patient comfort and satisfaction. See, that it, you have to understand occlusion to be predictive in giving, in giving complete satisfaction and comfort to your patients. That's why it's essential for everyday dentistry. When you put a filling in and you, then you try to adjust the bite on that high filling, whether you know it or not, you're adjusting occlusion. And it would sure help if you knew what you were doing. Uh, and the other thing is, I would like for you to think of occlusion as a factor of health of patients where we take a totally different attitude from that of the usual and customary dentist of pull and fill and such as that. I want you to start thinking in terms of my role as a dentist is to get your mouth not only healthy but comfortable and long-term maintainable. See, that's what we talk about with the comfort of a mouth. Patients really want this. Uh, you won't run patients off if you present it properly, and we're going to try to give you a little idea, too, how to do that, too.